Hey everybody, welcome back to day three of Inspiration from Kick-Ass Tutor Women. This is celebrating right now is the final week of International Women's Month, Women's History Month. And so to celebrate that, we're going through every day looking at a different inspirational tutor woman and why she inspires me and what we can learn from her. So, so far we've done Margaret Beaufort and Catherine Fenkel, and today we've got another one who's super cool scheduled. So, I'm just going to open my notes right here. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so... Today's woman is pretty well known in popular culture. She has made appearances. Oh, I should tell you, if you hear noises, my windows open. It's like one of the first really nice warm days in ages. You think Southern Spain, it's always hot and in August it is, but in the winter it just rains all the time and these houses are so damp and it's just like perpetually cold. So anyway, today it's not raining. I could hang my laundry out to dry super cool and um and the windows open so you might hear wind and things like that okay so today's woman and she's known in popular culture um she made appearances in like the tutors and if you've ever read anything about henry's relationship with anne boleyn she's gonna pop up but a lot of that is based on kind of the drama and the sensationalism of it, kind of like the tabloid reading it in Us Weekly kind of thing, without really looking at the woman herself. So she was a mystic, she was a nun, and she was one of the few women who ever dared to question Henry VIII to his face. Um, she also started life as a very humble servant girl, and she is, drum roll, Elizabeth Barton, the Maid of Kent, the Holy Maid of Kent. So, Elizabeth Barton, you will know her as the woman who prophesied that Henry wasn't going to live for a month if he married Anne Boleyn. She was born, very humbly, about 1506, and when she was about 18 or so, she entered service for a farmer. His name was Thomas Cobb. Now, this was quite a common career move for women. Even women who would become great ladies would spend time in service. It, there was nothing wrong with it at all. Um, even the indomitable Bess of Hardwick, who is my history crush, um, she spent time working in, kind of in service for higher up families. And it was, it was just kind of something that you did. You would go and you would learn how other families did things. You would learn household management and you'd be introduced to new people. And hopefully you would find a good match and you would get married out of it. So all in all, it's a good deal for everybody. Even poor people, very poor people would have had servants in this way. Um, they would have taken in children, or, you know, teenagers from nearby, um, paid their room and board and a very small wage and, and it worked. Um, <clears throat> generally, the contracts were for a year and after that they could be renewed or both parties could move on to somebody else. So Elizabeth would have lived in the servant's quarters up in the attic for Thomas Cobb. And she had been this poor working girl. And Thomas Cobb, he had actually been a bailiff and he was a steward and helped run the Archbishop of Canterbury's estates in the parish. They lived in a town called Adlington in Kent. Um, he was actually the most senior officer on the manor. He was very important in the local community. And the priest of the town was called Richard Masters. Before him, interestingly, um, Erasmus had been the rector in like 1511. He had held that, that position. So the town had this kind of um, notoriety with his relationship to Erasmus. Okay, so Elizabeth joins Cobb's home around late 1524, early 1525. Like I said, she was a late teenager. And her role on the farm, she would have swept and tidied up first thing in the morning, milked the cows, she would have fed all the animals, made breakfast, and the women were part of 
all kinds of things on the farm. They did baking and brewing and they took corn to the mill and they would make butter and cheese and they would handle the chickens and all kinds of stuff. They also would have their own garden that they would use for the kitchen and they would work on spinning and making clothing. So there was a lot for them to do. Um, at Easter, about 1520, or at Easter in 1525, this was about a couple of weeks, maybe uh, two months or so after having been hired, Elizabeth got really sick. She, her throat would swell up so much that she actually would need to struggle for her breath. And it seemed as if she had, quote, suffered the pangs of death itself. Everybody was really afraid that the swelling was going to keep her from being able to breathe. And there were times when it would just kind of come and go in waves. It seemed to subdue itself, and then it would come back. And this lasted for months. She was moved to the servants from the servants' attic to one of the children's rooms. Um, there was a baby who was really ill, and so they nursed them together. And it was just really not a good scene for her. By November, she was still really sick. And, of course, all this time, Thomas Cobb had been paying for her, paying for her care and doctors and her board, everything like that, even though she couldn't work. Um, she must have really been afraid that, you know, her time was going to end. Obviously, they're, they're not going to renew a, uh, a contract. Oh, my gosh. I've got... I forgot to turn off my music. <laughs> That's really funny. I've got to do that. Um, okay. Sorry. So, I just heard this, like noise coming from that, my headphones. Um, anyway, she would have been really afraid that her, um, her contract was going to end. And so she's probably also very bored. She'd spent months just laying there. And I, when I broke my shoulder, I spent two months laying in bed with my immobilizer on. It was so boring. And I even had audiobooks and my phone to play with. So I can't even imagine how boring this must have been for her through Easter and summer and into November. So she started to mutter and she kind of got delirious. She didn't eat much. And um, so maybe there was some lack of, um, of food and you know she was starting to really kind of get really delirious. Sometimes she would talk about the seven deadly sins and the Ten Commandments and biblical verses she had heard and people actually started to listen to her. And soon she got kind of well, and Cobb said that she should come sit at the dinner table with him and his wife, which is like a huge deal. She's a servant, and now she's sitting at the dinner table. So Cobb asked the priest, this Richard Masters, to come and visit her. And there was a local man as well, Edward Thwaites. They came, and this is the start of her story, and it, this is where it kind of gets mysterious. Some people say that the men had this plot to exploit her. But it also really seems as if they took everything at face value. Later on, Thwaites would write um, a pamphlet about her, and it seems like at the time they really took her at face value, and they started to think of her as, as a prophetess. So Masters wrote about her to the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Wareham, and he visited her immediately, and he thought the case was fascinating. And he told Masters, you know, if she has any similar speeches, you have to come get me right away. And more people come to see her from Christ College in Canterbury. She still was really sick, and she continued just being in these trances. She was talking about visiting heaven. She said she was, um, you know, had the visions of the Virgin. And she actually was almost caught in a lie when she said that the Virgin told her that the nearby chapel in the small hamlet, there was a small hamlet close by called Court at Street, and they had a chapel there. And she said that the chapel should ring the bell for a miracle. And this is commonly um, when a miracle would happen, they would ring the bell. So this was a common kind of thing. The problem was they didn't actually have any bells in that chapel. So it seemed as if she had made that up because if she had really had this vision, you would know that there weren't bells in the chapel. And so it was pointed out to her, well, there aren't actually any bells at that chapel. And she recovered and she started talking about other things like what the hermit who lived there had eaten for dinner, um, which also wouldn't be a very difficult thing to guess. Um, but people were really, people were really moved by her and uh, they really seemed to take her at face value. Um, time goes on, her faith is examined. She 
one thing she would do is she would claim to have witnessed the angels and the devils fighting for her inquisitor's soul. So somebody would come and question her about her faith and she would go into this trance and say, oh, I see the angels and devils fighting over your soul. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? Huh? And she really held kind of sway over people. She also started to use her trances to attack the religious reform movement. So this is likely where we see some kind of influence of the people who are around her now who are kind of the traditionalists um, but her popularity starts to grow throughout Kent on one particular day she'd said that a miracle was going to be expected and between two and three thousand people came to see her that's a lot of people they couldn't actually all fit on the street they were like looking out of windows and stuff she talked for hours that day she was prostrate at the feel of uh, the feet the feet of the statue of the Virgin Mary and then she declared that she was completely healed so go her and it became this sensation it became so much of a sensation that the Archbishop sent her report to the king and Henry passed the report to Thomas More and then he was even so interested in it that he followed up and asked him more what he thought about it More was skeptical he said that there was nothing that quote a right simple woman might in my mind speak of it in her own wit well enough. So basically, yeah, any woman could have thought about this, and I think any woman could have thought, thought it up. But he even admitted that, quote, because it was constantly reported for a truth that God wrought in her and a miracle was showed upon her, I durst now nor would not be bold in judging the matter. So basically, I can't, I can't really say. She's hedging his bets. This is right at the time when Henry starts his courtship of Anne Boleyn. And Elizabeth's reputation is growing. She said she wanted to become a nun, and Archbishop Wareham arranged for her to enter a convent. She entered the Benedictine House of St. Sepulchre's in Canterbury, and at the time it was already 400 years old. It was this really stately nunnery, and she lived very quietly there. She was very virtuous. Um, she had kind of the run-of-the-mill visions of angels and martyrs and confessors, and she would talk to people um, when people's family members died. She would talk to the deceased spirits and give people comfort that way. Um, she lived very simply. Her furniture that she had was two cushions, ancient cushions, two rugs, a small mattress with two blankets, two pillows, and a bolster. She also had two plates, four dishes, and two saucers, and a basin and candlesticks, two candlesticks, and a plank of wood for a table and a small wooden chest. And when she received things, she would give them away. She would give her clothing to younger nuns, and there's a story of a particular man who had asked her to intervene when, with God when he was very sick. And later he heard that of the four nobles he had given her, she gave it all away to charity except for like six shillings. So he was bummed about that. Um, and so there she was living this quiet life, talking to people, to the you know spirit of your dead grandmother, having, um, do, I, do I sound skeptical? I'm actually really not particularly skeptical of this kind of things. It, it, it just seems, um, seems a little too obvious but you know go her and for people believing it like that was real for them you know and um and so I'm what can I say I'm skeptical I, I it's like if people believe that something is real it becomes real right so if enough people believe something it becomes a thing this is getting really philosophical but you know the United States of America is the United States of America simply because enough people agree that this is the boundary and this is how it runs. And so at the time, enough people agreed that Elizabeth Barton was having these visions and talking to the spirit of their dead grandmother. So you know what? Like, that's what she was doing. Just like the United States of America, like, it's not, it's not inherent when you look at the world from above you don't see the United States of America and it's like map and it's like has a, a label on it it's just because people have all reached an agreement that that's what it is and it's the same thing with Elizabeth Barton I think people all kind of agreed that that's what she was doing she believed that's what she was doing they believe that's what she was doing so people got messages from their dead grandmother awesome for them um anyway 
As long as she was having simple visions like this, talking to the dead grandmother, there was like no problem at all. And I'm thinking about dead grandmothers because my daughter is obsessed with Moana right now, um, in which a spirit of a grandmother guides Moana. And it's very beautiful and it's very moving and it makes me cry. And also, interestingly, I'm totally going off, off track here, but Moana in Spain and Italy, they had to change the name and call it Viana because there's an Italian porn star called Moana who's like a famous Italian porn star named Moana. So all the stuff here that you get that's like the dolls and Hannah has a plate and a cup, it all says Viana on it, which was very confusing for me. Anyway, I really got to get past this dead grandmother thing. It's so much a part of my life right now is the, the spirit. She watches it all the time. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me through that. Um, so October 1528, Archbishop Wareham wrote a letter to Cardinal Wolsey. He is the papal legate, legate. He is, of course, trying to get Henry VIII his divorce at this point. At this point, we haven't yet gotten to the Legantine court, but um, Cardinal Wolsey's working his buns off trying to get a divorce for Henry. And Barton wanted to talk with Wolsey and Wareham respecting Barton so much, is happy to set that up. And, and so this shows that Elizabeth Barton is starting to become a little bit more political here. She's starting to speak out against Henry's attempt at divorce. And later, Thomas Cranmer, when he replaced Wareham as archbishop, said that he believed that both Wolsey and Wareham were afraid of her. So now she has access to Woolsey, and she actually then would meet Henry on several occasions. He met with her, and she was very honest with him, and she told him, you know, that it wasn't right, that she didn't think it was right, and of course Henry didn't listen to her, so we've got the Legantine Court, and by 1530, Barton is becoming this force. She corresponds with the Pope. She told the Pope that there would be plagues if the Pope favored Anne Boleyn, and that the Pope himself would be destroyed if he didn't favor or support Catherine Baragon. So she's like saying this to popes, right? It's like, then Henry directly, she's got some cojones. Go her. Um, Thomas More eventually actually met her after being a little bit suspicious several years before. He seemed very impressed with her. And later on, <clears throat> he would write to her and he would give her some friendly advice, telling her that she should stop talking about the king and his divorce. Um, he actually did become convinced that she was speaking for God, but he didn't want to see her killed over it. So he said, look, it's like my advice. You should stop talking about this. By 1532, it seems like this marriage between Henry and Anne is going to go through. And Elizabeth still keeps talking about it. That October, October of 1532, Henry and Anne passed through Canterbury on their way to Calais. And they had actually both been a bit worried about her prophecies. They reached out to her and they tried a couple different avenues to get her to be quiet. Henry actually asked her if he could make her an abbess in return for her kind of shutting up about the marriage situation. And Anne Boleyn's mother sent her a note asking if she would like to come be a lady in waiting on, on Anne, which is a huge honor. You know, people are scrambling to try and get their daughters places like that. But Elizabeth turned down both of these offers, which kind of infuriated Henry. Henry did marry Anne in secret. And now Elizabeth had to prove that her prophecies were true. At one point, she said that he wasn't going to live for a month. Another point, he said she said seven months. So is Henry going to die now? Is he going to die in a month or seven months? He didn't die right away. And people didn't really start to doubt her at that point. But by July of 1533, Henry realized that he had survived all of the prophecies. And he was becoming really furious at her because she would not shut up. And so he asks his new minister, Thomas Cromwell, to have Cranmer begin an investigation into her. So Cranmer invites her to come. And she didn't really think this was any kind of a big deal because she had, you know, written letters to popes and, and had talked to Henry. And um, so she writes to Cranmer. Only there he starts to, like, interrogate her. And she insisted that her visions were true. She also asked for more time. She was saying that she might not have actually interpreted them all correctly. And maybe she could go back and get a definitive answer. 
and then she'll come back and give the definitive answer. So let me just go back and readjust, recalibrate my relationship with the angels. I'll come back in like two weeks and tell you exactly what the angel said. So Cranmer plays along with this, and Elizabeth thought she'd done well, but Cranmer was just trying to get what he could from her before sending her to Cromwell. One interesting note, Barton, Elizabeth Barton had written to Catherine of Aragon. Now Catherine of Aragon refused to see her, which was very clever on her point, on her part. Her chaplain, Catherine's chaplain, did talk to her, and he would later be attainted for misprision for of treason for talking with Elizabeth. So he got in trouble for talking with Elizabeth. Cromwell really wanted to get Elizabeth to confess to having had a relationship with Catherine because that would make his life so easy. That would be such a good way to kind of silence Catherine. But uh, Barton, of course, there wasn't one. And even Cromwell had said that, uh, that Catherine had been very wise in not having had a relationship with Elizabeth Barton. So Barton sent to the tower. Um, Cranmer extricated all of the information that he wants out of her, sends her to Cromwell, and she's in the tower. And she starts to crack under interrogation. And she tells Cromwell that she never had visions. Everything she said was feigned of her own imagination, only to satisfy the minds of them which resorted unto her and to obtain other worldly praise. So... That said, she also kind of vacillated. She wrote back to some supporters saying she did stand by her vision. It was all a very messy time for her. Um, she was probably very confused. Um, you know, I'm sure she was petrified. Who knows? Um, that autumn of 1533, Cromwell started to round up everybody who had known and supported her, had them arrested, also had any pamphlets and books about her burned. Um, anything about her prophecies were burned. So the problem, though, is that there's no proof of treason because she announced everything that she thought was going to happen. She told Henry everything she prophesied, so there was no secrecy in it. So what are you going to charge her with? Um, at one point, Cromwell starts to get up in a group of people and say that she had meant to induce the people of England to rise against Henry, and that was her crime, was you know trying to get England to rise against Henry. And Cromwell spoke for a long time about her treachery. It riled up the crowd, and they start chanting, to the stake, to the stake, um, which I'm sure was also very petrifying for her. Everybody at this point starts to really distance themselves from her. The, the nuns and the monks all begged Henry for forgiveness. Uh, in November of 1533, she has to do a public penance. She was you know, dragged out in front of everybody, dragged through the streets and had to give a short confession saying that she was a most miserable and wretched person who had been the original of all of this mischief and my, by my falsehood have deceived all these persons here and many now present. And then a sermon was given and then she has to go to Canterbury and do the same thing a couple of weeks later. So it was kind of the dog and pony show of getting Elizabeth Barton to recant her stuff. Um, in January 1534, Parliament convened, and one of the things they did was bring up all of the attainders against Barton. If Parliament sentenced you, you could be condemned without a trial. So she was sentenced to death in Parliament, and on April 20th, 1534, she was hanged. She said... Um, her speech when she was being hanged <coughs> was, Hither am I come to die, and I have not been the only cause of mine own death, which most justly I have deserved, but am also the cause of all these persons which at this time here suffer, because there are other people who were killed with her, her associates. Um, and then she kind of stuck up for herself here. She says, And yet to say the truth, I am not so much to, to be blamed, considering it was well known unto these learned men that I was a poor wench without learning, and therefore they might have easily perceived that the things that were done by me could not proceed in no such sort, because the things which I feigned was profitable unto them, and therefore they much praised me and bare me in hand 
that it was the Holy Ghost and not I that did them. And then I, being puffed up with their praises, fell into a certain pride and foolish fantasy with myself, and I thought I might feign what I would, which thing hath brought me to this case. Which, you know, could be quite truthful. That could be how it went down. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I think that there's, there should be a lot of credence given to people when they're about to be hung with what they say. Um, because I think for a lot of people, we tend to now minimalize, like, like I just did with the grandmother spirit thing, um, you know, how real this was for people. Um, the, the state of their soul, uh, and, and the immediate state of, you know, going to purgatory was such a real thing for people, um, that, you know, these kind of deathbed confessionals and, um, things like that, you know, it seems like there might be more credence to give to them. I don't know. So it seemed like, it seems like a plausible thing here that Elizabeth said that, you know, she started to say these things, people started to believe it. And so, and it was profitable to them and it got her kind of puffed up. Makes sense, right? She's this poor 19 year old servant. And suddenly the Archbishop of Canterbury is getting her hooked up with the nunnery. And, um, she's talking to the King and to writing to popes, you know, so, um, I can't really blame her that much. Her head was chopped off after she was hanged, hung, um, and it was mounted at either London Bridge or the city gates, but her headless body was permitted burial in the church of the Greyfriars in London. I think Elizabeth is really fascinating because she's this example of this really poor girl who was able to kind of use these you know, soft political powers um, to get the attention of the king and to, you know, really, she really had Anne Boleyn and the king quite worried based on her prophecies. So I think she's a fascinating person to look at um, because of that. And I just realized you could totally see my daughter's sweater at the back there on the chair. Um, it's funny. Um, so yeah, so she, um, yeah, she's just this really interesting person who, started out as just this young servant and she had the attention of popes and kings and this was all just because people believed her she um she she believed herself and she capitalized i guess you could look look back on it and um kind of dissect it uh, and look at like the rising fear of change and um you know, the traditionalists and uh, you know she was able to capitalize on that and she did it very intelligently and she was a whiz bang at marketing her brand so yeah and she also had no fear you know she said these things she really believed in herself and she really believed in what she was saying and she got a lot of attention for it had a lot of important people standing by her so there was clearly some charisma there and you know being able to tell people that she could see the duel going on between the angels and the demons over their souls I and mean, that took some guts so it's Elizabeth Barton, and I hope you have enjoyed. I hope you learned something new about her. If you already knew about her, I hope you, you know, learned something new. And uh, yeah, I think she's a really cool, cool chick, cool lady. Um, she was able to do a lot in a really short time and have a, a big impact on, on history. And uh, yeah, meeting with kings, right? So go her, go her. Um, cool. So that's Elizabeth. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about an early female Tudor writer. So stay tuned for that. Check out the Facebook group. I love all of the comments and, you know, seeing people in there. So cool. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Okay. See you soon.